education environment sustainability meeting and we're going to have a call to order roll call and just as a reminder to all who are in attendance this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the county's youtube page calling the roll miss simon here miss stevens present mr jones mr jones is absent at the moment mr shrine mr shrine is absent at the moment miss conwell present there is a quorum thank you any public comment no madam chair no one is signed in can I have a motion to approve minutes from May 3rd, 2023? So moved. Second. second. Okay, second by um, Councilwoman Stevens. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Minutes approved. Two items today, ARPA items. The first is 2023-0125. Resolution number 2023-0125, awarding a total sum not to exceed $100,000 to the Harvard Community Services Center for the Students of Promise Exposure Field Trip and College Tour Transportation Project from the District 3 and District 8 ARPA Community Grant Funds. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Madam Chair and as Councilwoman, it's a pleasure to be here. It is definitely different preparing to stand here as opposed to you know, I used to prepare to sit there. But all the same, I am definitely honored to uh, to be here today. Um, what I'm going to do is to kind of... Can you identify yourself? Sure. Even though we know you, but I we have a so record. I am so sorry. And... My name is Bob Ivory, and I direct the Students of Promise Closing the Achievement Gap Initiative. And I have with me... Joe Fouché. And Ms. Elaine Golston. Elaine Golston. Good to see you all. Okay, thank you so much. I just have a brief kind of set the backdrop uh, opening that I just wanted to share. And in essence, you know, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm here as we just were introduced with Ms. Elaine Goldston, who is the executive director of the Harvard Community Service Center, and Joe Fouché, who is a consultant and partner with both the Harvard Community Center and Students of Promise. Um, greatly in part, uh, to your leadership and foresight, this initiative is what it is today and why I'm here today. Um, hundreds of students, uh, families have been impacted by Students of Promise since 2014. Um, through your le leadership and through what we have been able to am amass is addressing the academic, social, and emotional needs of the students in the districts that I'm currently participating in, which is Cleveland Heights University Heights, Bedford School District, and Warrensville City School District. Um, with that said, since 2014, hundreds, amongst hundreds of students have been impacted by this effort. If I could just segue for a second, because I believe what I'm about to show will set a backdrop to what I will continue, which is directly and specifically uh, related to our uh, the proposal and the items on the agenda. So if you could just play, it's only like two and a half minutes I forwarded, and if it can be cued, it's a video. Uh, if you can just uh, watch your monitors for a couple of minutes, it will set the backdrop for uh, the remainder of our presentation. So got a hand and I my Lord, Lord somewhere to stay. Can you hear me praying? Me praying. I'm building me a home. When you hear me praying, me praying. I'm building me a home, my, Lord. my Lord. This earthly house. Gonna soon, decay. It's gonna soon decay, and my soul got a hand. God somewhere to, to stay. Mm -hmm. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. I've already come.
gonna soon decay And my soul gotta have a Lord somewhere to stay When you hear me shouting, shouting, shouting. I'm building me a My soul got a hand And my soul got a hand And my soul got a hand Somewhere to stay My Lord Okay, the reason why I wanted to show that and I'm going back to my mentor, uh, retired state senator C.J. Prentice, who would always say, before you present, you first present this story. Mm -hmm. What I attempted to do was show you our story, which is the students of promise from the respective school districts that we just flew 35 of them to Atlanta, to Alabama for college visits of four universities, Alabama State University, Spelman University, Morehouse College, um, Morris Brown College, and the host of historical uh, uh, museums that you may have recognized on that screen and like why would that be relevant to what we need to do here locally because what we did a thousand miles away what we're presenting is to do more of that here locally right here in Ohio right here in our own region right here in our neighboring states with all the resources that we have what makes that difficult is transportation the cost of transportation I can present which has ultimately gets presented back to you because it's your dollars that have helped make these type of trips happen. The cost of commercial coaches, transportation, just a simple example real quick. There was an activity that we wanted to do to take some students from Cleveland Heights to uh, Mr. Fouché's facility at the lanes. And it was about 30 or 40 students that we wanted to transfer for our parent um, student engagement activity. The cost for transportation, because we could not get school buses, there was no flexibility to, to get transportation in that way. So normally, we go out and we get some commercial or some private transportation. When I got an invoice back, and I, well, I, not an invoice, but when I got the quote back, that it would cost nearly $1,800, $1,800 to go from Cleveland Heights to Bedford and back. There's no way I could consciously, consciously commit county dollars to do something like so obviously that did not happen however with our own resources with our own cut bus with our own minivans more students wouldn't have been able to attend that activity and I can go on and on as how many times that our students have not had opportunity to be exposed what CJ would call that six block radius of awareness that most students have there are students that miss out on opportunities academically, socially, emotionally, simply because of transportation and can't get there. And that's no fault at the districts because they're uh, challenged and they have their uh, uh, issues with providing just daily transportation. But there's so many out of school time opportunities, Saturday opportunities, weekend opportunities. Our summer program starts in two weeks uh, when school is out in two or three weeks. So what I'm laying it back, um, drop for Madam Chair, is that to be able to have the resources to secure vehicles that we have found, that we have researched, and that we have direct access to will help us to provide even more opportunities like you saw. And we have, we've done Ohio State. We've been to uh, University of Dayton, University of Cincinnati, uh, Ohio University, my school. Uh, we've gone to Philadelphia. We've gone to Freedom uh, Hall in Philadelphia. We've gone to Chicago. We've gone to DePaul University. I'm naming the things that are within our region that does not require a 54-passenger bus at the thousands of dollars that that costs if we could just possibly have our own access to our own vehicles in which we can provide even more programmatic opportunities for the students that on that screen in my opinion, and I believe you would share, they're the future of Cuyahoga County. And I, and I wanted to also, uh, and I can provide you the hard data, but I'm going to give you just uh, a preview of some of the data, because uh, on the top of my mind, I had the linkage coordinators uh, uh, send me some summaries over the last couple of days. In Bedford, 
50% of the students in Bedford this school year, there's some 70 students that they target, 50% of those students combined earn either honor roll or merit roll. That's 50%. In Cleveland Heights, I believe out of the 42 students that are participating, I believe in the course of this year, a combined 21 of those students of promise were on a roll and merit roll. The same percentile is in Warrensville. So what I'm suggesting is not to say that we take the credit for the success of, of our teachers and our principals and everybody that's doing hard work to make our students successful. I believe we have clear evidence and clear data that this initiative through your leadership and the dollars that you've uh, allowed us to uh, uh, provide for this initiative thus far since 2014 has irreputable evidence that there is impact that is being had where students of promise exist. Now we want to take that to even another level by being able to provide them access to more colleges, more career pathways, more exposure opportunities by simply being able to transport them more effectively and cost effectively from point A to point B. I want to yield to uh, uh, Ms. Goldston, who is the, our partner in this and also our fiscal agent, and also to Mr. Fouché. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, uh, I'm not going to be redundant. Uh, Bob has told you all about the program and how awesome it is. And it comes at a time when our young people are really struggling to be involved. And what better opportunity for those who couldn't come would be able to join in with Bob and, and the students at Promise. I'm going to tell you something. I am really, really concerned not only about the children that Bob has entertained, but the children that are not being entertained. And if we could be a partner with him to make sure that other children have this opportunity. We hear about our children every evening, every night, every day about what's happening. And we want to be part of this. And we just are so proud of Bob. I knew Bob. I just have to give a little history. When he was at JFK High School working with the children and how often, how often he would come to us and other groups about food and clothing for these young people, and he continues to do the work. Congratulations, Bob, on all that you do for the families in the community. Thank you. Madam Chair and committee members, um, I'm Joe Fouché. I, I just want to thank you all for allowing us and, and considering us uh, for these funds. Uh, we especially want to uh, thank Council President Pernell Jones and Council uh, District 3 Councilman uh, Marty Sweeney for uh, being willing to contribute their funds uh, to this to this great cause uh, that has been proven in this district to be successful and be serving the kids. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Any questions, committee members? Okay, we'll start um, with Vice um, President Cheryl Stevens. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to talk to us. I, too, understand and represent one of the districts uh, that where the program is operating successfully. Um, question. Uh, you say transportation. Does that mean you want to acquire vehicles and provide for their operating costs, like the drivers, the gas, the maintenance? Our primary ask, thank you for that question, our primary ask is for the purchase of the vehicles. We have identified uh, one particular vehicle, which is a 32-passenger uh, bus, which uh, was the property of the village of um, Highland Hills, which was their senior vehicle. It's, uh, I, would, I probably should, I, I can't hammer a nail together or, or change oil, so I probably should have Mr. Fauché uh, speak more in depth of the vehicle itself, but uh, it's been inspected. Uh, it was their senior vehicle, low miles. I could just imagine a senior uh, vehicle in the village of Highland Hills, and it's traveling in the Tri-City area, um, how conditioned it most, most likely is. The other vehicle we are looking at is uh, a 15-passenger 15, 15 van, which would allow our coordinators not to have to have a CDL, which means we can travel with 15 students to and fro. Uh, we do fortunately, you know, have other um, kind of capacity building uh, opportunities that could and will uh, manage 
uh, we will have uh, uh, certified and CDL drivers, background checked and so forth. There is maintenance obviously in, in owning in, in man, uh, uh, vehicles and gas and so forth. Uh, our cost that we cannot um, kind of levy is the physical purchase of the vehicles. So with 32 passengers, do you need a CDL? Yes, yes, the 32 pass, anything over 15, yes, needs a, needs a CDL driver. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Where will these be housed? We'll be housing them in Maple Heights and also in Oakwood Village. You have garages there? Or are they in control, controlled we have, space? Or? We have commercial warehouse space. Um, luckily, uh, Oakwood Village, we haven't had too many issues with break-ins. Uh, we have had some issues in Maple Heights, so we're not sure if we're going to uh, store them overnight in Maple Heights. They may be there during the daytime, um, and, but for the most part, it will be overnight in Oakwood Village. So the budget for the acquisition of these two vans is two twenty, or the budget is a hundred thousand. So the the budget for the acquisition of the of the vehicles, and it, we're thinking it's going to be three vehicles, would be one hundred thousand dollars. the The overall budget was two hundred twenty thousand. Um, and so you all are helping with the purchase of the vehicles. And so the balance, the 120, will be for the operating program, will be operating program dollars? Correct. Correct. We would definitely need to have provisions for uh, qualified drivers. Obviously, there's fuel involved, obviously. And there is insurance, absolutely insurance. And then there's some upkeep and some upgrade to the vehicles. Uh, the vehicles are in excellent condition. However, to make it um, uh, suitable for our needs and our children, I want to make sure that there are video cameras inside the vehicle and outside the vehicle. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, the cooling system is, is up to date. We want to make sure that, you know, we, it's weatherized, you know. So there are some things that we are going to do, and I think that's also in the budget. I think it was like 15000 versus uh, worth of upgrades, new tires, uh, a video system inside that records what's going on, and videos outside, I guess, how buses are these can all see. all recent model vehicles, like they're all 2019 and younger? No, the, the bus is an older vehicle. It's the Village of Lacewoods. It's a 2003, but with 50,000 miles that has been inspected yes. that will all uh, have passed uh, state inspections. So, and like I say, I'm not the, the, the technical person, but even Mr. Fouché had to educate me on the lifespan of a commercial bus versus us persons in a 2003, uh, I don't know, Camry or something. Uh, are are you a car guy, Joe? Um, no, but I slept at the Holiday Inn Express last night. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, um, in, in my travels, I've uh, I, I have certification as a, a school business manager through the state of Ohio, uh, and for different school districts, and through my own operations, I've provided transportation to school districts or with school districts. Uh, buses, diesel buses, 70 passenger buses. So I'm, I'm very familiar with, with that process. And, I, and I, I do a little work myself when I have to. Yeah. But the, I, I think the essence of the question was about the age of the vehicles. Right. So, so there's the useful life. Uh, what, what's the useful life? Because typically, if you told me you were acquiring a 2003 something, I would not be real keen on it. And, uh, and, and Mr. Ivory wasn't real keen on it either. <laughs> so wh what we did is we looked at the, the overall condition of the bus. Uh, we went up underneath the bus, looked at the rust. Um, we looked at the mileage. The, the, this one particular bus only had 60,000 miles on it. And so the useful life of a, of a vehicle like that can probably be in excess of two to 300,000 miles easy. Um, and this particular vehicle was just uh, in mint condition, and you can't tell the difference. The, the average layperson can't tell the difference between a, a 2003, a well-kept 2003 bus and a, and a, a well-kept or a not so well-kept 2019 bus. But this particular bus that we saw was ideal for us, and it, what it allows us to do is have a bigger capacity you know, um, if you if you look at a brand new Sprinter 
a 15 passenger bus that you might be spending eighty thousand ninety thousand dollars or more on just one vehicle and that only gives us 14 passengers in it and that doesn't accommodate yeah you know, it serves one purpose but we need probably close to 50 people uh, per event that we do that we need to be able to tra transport and so with the three vehicles we'll be able to do that thank you thank you councilman Kawa. Uh, through the chair to uh, Mr. Ivory, where is the remaining of the balance coming from? Because I see that my colleague, she asked many of my questions. Sure. The 220,000 sure. is in, the, but we're only giving a. The remaining of the balance, thank you for the question, is the ability of Students of Promise and its existence is to. Uh, expand its capacity by utilizing its partners, utilizing its foundations, utilizing those organizations that have uh, supported us over the years. So we plan on continuing that model. Last year, Students of Promise received uh, $350,000 from the uh, congressionally directed spending uh, through the uh, Senator's office. You know, those resources we have used to expand each capacity of Students of Promise. I will know, or should I say we shall know, maybe this time next month, if we are the a successful a recipient of the next round, which is 2324 through the senator's office, which is 1.6 million. So what I'm suggesting is that, uh, and 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 you should know that these dollars, uh, at least last year dollars, is how we flew to San Francisco. I mean, well, we did go to San Francisco last year. How we flew 35 students to Atlanta. How we did that is because there were no buses available, and the cost of the one bus company that finally said we can ma match this, there was no way that we were going to pay that much to take 35 students. So to answer your question, the way we will close that gap is to continue our fundraising, continue our grant writing, and continue the relationships with our partners that have successfully helped us to meet all of our um, uh, budgetary needs. So excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Senator Brown, U.S. Senator Brown's yes, office you provided you with Correct. With well, it's what his office, it was his support through the Senate congressional spending that had to have his support for even to go to the next round. So it was the office of Senator Sherrod Brown and his support of last year's uh, congressional direct, congressionally directed spending that awarded students a promise. Actually, it was a total of $750,000. 400000 of that was our other partner, which is My Brother's Keeper um, at the Urban League. And then Students of Promise's portion was three hundred and fifty. This year, our partner is the, the, the Harvard Community Center, where we apply for $1.6 million in order to expand Students of Promise into four additional learning communities. So what I'm setting the backdrop for is that we are growing, therefore our partners are growing, therefore the resources that we uh, have been able to uh, write successful grants for, that's also increasing as well. So to close that gap for this bus, we feel very comfortable that we won't just have buses, we will be able to contract drivers and have gas and have uh, and new tires on them as well. And, and if I could, I would be remiss, we do not have those funds yet. And we were hoping that that video that you all just saw will tug at your heartstrings and that other council members may want to contribute and participate in what the Students of Promise does. So we would definitely leave that door open for anyone that would want to help fill that gap of that, that, that $220,000. That's it on my questions. I have questions. Okay, thank you. So I want to be clear, the $100,000 on the table today is designated for the purchase of just the bus or the bus and the van and it's, the third vehicle? Sure, it's three vehicles. For one, 100. Yeah, okay. one is, you have the dollars around, probably more memorized than me, but I think the one is 35000 Yes. And then there is 25000 and then there is forty for the, uh, the next... Um, a bus, forty thousand for the next bus. So that gives us one hundred. Okay. So you will you have two buses? It will be two buses and a van and a, and a fifteen passenger. And then the logic behind that, Madam Chair, is the two buses will be the equivalent to one fifty-four passenger 
uh, coach that we get from Barron's, that we get from Lakefront Tours, that we get from Precious Cargo, those 54 passengers that cost an enormous amount of money. So to have two coaches, uh, 32 passengers apiece, obviously that would suffice uh, the need for a 54 passenger, uh, even though they would require a CDL driver. However, the um, 15 passenger, which does not require a, a uh, CDL driver, then our linkage coordinators can transport up to 15 students, which there are a lot of opportunities that we miss because we can't take a small group of uh, students across town. So do you normally use lease a bus like you just said it's a yes, lease we sent out a, we sent out a, we sent out quotes and uh through uh either third-party vendors or i'll call myself and we get quotes back i just went through it for our but you our, flew to san francisco you said oh so we flew to san francisco you, is that an aberration because normally you take these buses oh no anything coastal we're going to fly so you're um, flying and we, you're taking leasing a bus yes once we get to san francisco we had ground travel in san francisco just like when we just flew to Atlanta, what you just saw, we flew to Atlanta and had to get obviously ground travel for those five days, which was closest. But in this case, the reason why we, this was the first time we flew to Atlanta because there were no buses, no buses available. Okay. And the one that was available, it just cost too much. Okay, so the title to these vehicles are gonna be in the name of Harvard um, Community Center Services? Community Services. They're gonna take title? There are so there's a fiscal agent. agent. Take you take title, you take the money you purchase, they'll be okay. And they'll be stored somewhere else off site. And the employees will be of the community, your center. You're going to employ the CLE drivers. Are these going to be independent contractors? Yeah, we'll contract. So we will contract our like every service that Who's we have. We? That is Harvard or you? Har because they are the fiscal agent. Harvard. I will be the contract exactly. So I will obviously manage that process, but everything fiscal will come through. I understand. Harvard Community Service Center. Uh, but but they'll be independent but contractors. You're not hiring a driver full time. Correct. So each time you have to take a tour, you're going to have to find a CLE independent contractor to do that job. Right. And, and just to simplify just a little, because not just drivers, we contract a lot of services because we have relationships, however, with individuals. So it would not necessarily be finding a new driver each time. We have relationships, as we have relationships with drivers already. So it would be more so that kind of on-call service as opposed to, okay, who's gonna get, who's gonna drive us to Ohio State this week? No, we would have a pool identified, already background checked, already bonded, already pretty much I understand. knowing. I understand. So that would that's the concept. I understand. Um, and so how many of these um, college tours do you anticipate if you get these vehicles per year? I think we would do more than what we've done in the past, which has been three seasonally. We've always done a fall trip, which uh, has historically has been to D.C., uh, where we have to Howard or uh, to Washington Howard University has been our college tour there. We've gone to Morgan State University, but I think the value added to that experience is that our students get to meet our congressional leaders. We have gone to every. Uh, uh, we've gone to uh, uh, former Congresswoman Marsha Fudd. We've gone to Sher Senator Sherrod Brown's office. So that aspect of the tour where they can actually go and meet their law. So this is in, in the fall. You that's usually do fall a DC tour. trip Correct. in the fall. We do a DC in the and then fall. you do two others to Alabama. That's, that's the spring. Spring. And then in the summer, we usually do a regional trip. That's where we've gone to DePaul University in the summer. We've gone to uh, we've spent the, the day at Bowling Green and University of Dayton and then went over to Detroit. Uh, we've gone to um, Lehigh University where my younger brother is the, is the, is the uh, dean of students. Um, definitely not an HBCU, but to see, and, and this is something I'm glad I'm, I'm thinking about this, Lehigh University, which is tuition, is $70,000 a year. But I didn't know that they had $90 million in need-based financial aid. 
So that says to one of our students from Bedford or Cleveland Heights or Warrensville, so despite the tuition of 70000 a year, we learned that they have $90 million in need-based financial aid at Lehigh University. Okay. So we're looking at about 54 students per trip? Per trip? Yep. I'm sorry. How many students with these vehicles go normally? F about 50? Yeah, we, on we are always at, yes, always at 50, capacity. Well, capacity. It, it, okay. Well, we, we all have to factor in the chaperones on the bus. Yeah. For instance, we just took 35 to D.C., I mean to Atlanta, but we also had 12 adults. Yeah. So as you can imagine, supervision uh, for 14 and 15 years old, a thousand, well, not just a thousand miles away from home, Madam Chair, never have left home before. And if I could just parenthetically put this in perspective, we've had students in our entering suburban schools that had not been downtown Cleveland, had not been where we are. So to, to say we've gone to San Francisco, we've gone to Philadelphia, we've gone to Atlanta, we've gone to Birmingham, to a student that has never been downtown, never seen the West Side Market. So our vehicles will allow us to get that local travel, that local experience, that local exposure, and the wealth that's in Cuyahoga County. We're going to Ohio Tavern, uh, Ohio Caverns, Caverns, not Taverns, Caverns. We're going to Ohio Caverns this fall. Well, why is that significant? Because when I saw it in the third grade at Don Elementary, I never forgot going 70 miles, uh, 70 uh, feet below the surface. How'd you get down there? Through school? Through the, no, we had, we, we ran out of buses, yes. That was the first time you went? Well, I went when I was a kid. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I went, that was my first time when I field went trip in or? elementary school. That was a field yeah, trip. Yeah, I never got to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe so, I'll go on chaperone that one. Absolutely. If you go. Um, okay. So thank you for all that information. Did that raise any other questions of my colleagues? No? Okay. So um, I would thank you. This thank you. explains what's happening. And how many of these students typically go on to college that you expose to the different universities? You know, I can get that actual data to you. One thing that was encouraging while we were in Alabama State we had a student that met us that's at Alabama State that came on that trip. So I can give you the hard data of students that have actually gone to HBCUs. There's one story, and it's Cleveland Heights, and it will we'll resonate and I'm, and I'm sure have a, 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 a part in your heart, uh, uh, Councilman Stevens, that one of our star students, uh, and he graduated, I think, in 2019, his dad was my best friend and my college roommate at Ohio State University. He went to the University of, uh, he went to Tuskegee University. Uh, and one of our college tours, we went to Tuskegee University. He went to Tuskegee University himself when he graduated. Derek Beck passed away uh, his, uh, going into his senior year from a seizure in his sleep. He just received his, uh, his uh, degree this past weekend, his parents uh, posted on the Facebook. But he went to Tuskegee University, I believe because we took him to Tuskegee University. So we have several examples um, uh, where our students, once they saw and once we took them, just like when we went to Alabama State, Morris Brown in particular, uh, which just received a certification back a few years ago. However, because of that, they have so much financial aid now for their students. And there's a student that sat right there in that room and looked around and said, I can see myself here. So that is the advantage of, and that doesn't take away from, we've taken kids to Cleveland State and Case and, and universities around, around our region, but when we take them abroad and they can see themselves on that campus, it's not a place they're just visiting on a field trip, we have evidence that some of those students have chosen those universities as a choice. I think the Chair has a great question though. Anecdotally, do you remember, do you have a 40% uh, of your kids going on to college, whether it's, um, Tri-C or a four-year school? Of our students, I promise. Uh -huh. As we are in our eighth year, uh, I, and I just don't want to misquote what the actual percentile is, I can, if you would allow me to get that back, I can, and I can get some assistance with that because a good friend at Maple City School District, he's an administrator, uh, uh, Mr. Muwata, is doing his dissertation, and I think if this, if you could just share with your colleagues, because this is beyond us making our uh, 
approach for funds for a bus. This is, to me, speaks to the heart of the work that we all do and that you do and what you entrusted with taxpayer dollars that you have shared with us. Because this gentleman at, 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 at uh, Maple uh, City School District, who is doing his dissertation uh, in his final uh, phase for his PhD, he's doing his dissertation on the impact of school-based mentoring in an urban setting. Let me say that again. His dissertation is on the impact of school-based mentoring in an urban setting, or urban setting. What or whom is his study? Students of Promise. So would that include the questions that yes, my will. colleague and I asked about yes. the percentage of students Correct. who actually that go on to college after all these that. tours? Because yes. we're, we're funding these bus tours to right. colleges. Right. And, and, our, and you're funding them two, three, four, five, six fold. Yes, it would be great if I can come back and say out of 80 kids that went to a HBCU, X amount actually went there. But what we're trying to do is expose them of students that have met a significant amount of risk factors to even want to come to school every day. And because of what we are exposing them to and they see themselves as, they may not choose Morehouse or Spelman or Clark, but they may choose Cleveland State, Kent, or Tri-C. So that's and the we have question. evidence on Not that. necessarily yes. correlating the college sure. that they see, do they go on to college? Absolutely. Whether it's right. HBCU or not. So that's a right. question I think we would, I would like to see. Absolutely. Okay, great. Anything else? Okay, that would be really important. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, so can I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we approve this funding and send it through the standard process, which will be three readings. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you Good so work. much. We Good appreciate to see it. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Okay. Next item. Resolution number 2023-0128. Awarding a total sum not to exceed $10,000 to the Seeds of Literacy for the building capacity to support increased enrollment project from the District 9 ARPA Community Grant Fund. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bonnie Antler. I am the President and CEO of Seeds of Literacy. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'd like to share a little bit of background about Seeds of Literacy, what we do. Um, we do basic education and GED prep classes for adults. We take a very different approach to education. We actually do all one-on-one -on -one instruction. So we have a core of about 300 volunteer tutors. So students are able to work at their own pace and at their own academic level. We operate on 12-hour days. So students have classes morning, afternoon, and evening, Monday through Thursday, so students can attend whenever they like. We were initially founded by the Sisters of St. Joseph and became our own 501c3 in 2005, and we're actually celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. The need in the community is very large. Um, in the county, there is an, over a 40% illiteracy rate. In the city of Cleveland, there is a 66% illiteracy rate. Literacy is really defined as one's ability to kind of comprehend, not just solely linked to reading, so taking a linking it to some everyday tasks from bus schedules to prescription bottles, um, helping children with homework. Um, on average, we serve over 1,000 students every year. This fiscal year, we've seen a 17% increase. Um, so our need to increase our volunteer capacity has been great, and we're slowly working on that. Um, so we have a request in for $10,000 to help us implement this project. The total project budget is a little under $145,000. We've secured the majority of that funding. Um, with this, we are hoping to increase our volunteers by 20% and increase our retention rate to 70%. We also provided you guys with a couple handouts in regards to how SEEDS is different, the literacy rates um, by neighborhoods here in the city of Cleveland as well as how literacy really impacts every aspect of one's individual lives. Thank you. Any questions? 
As my colleagues know, I'm addicted to the written <laughs> word. I just don't understand how you don't learn how to read and learn how to love it from an early age. But we know part of that is sometimes the indifference in, among teachers in the classroom in the early ages and the distractions that kids see. And the pandemic was not a good thing for um, urban literacy. So um, we are the only organization in Northeast Ohio that really serves people who have no reading ability. So we will take students to teach the alphabet, phonic sounds, and really kind of help them. Um, and we do see that a little bit in our senior population who really want to come back just to learn how to read. So I, I, and I'm looking at the document that's in front of me. Is it 66% literacy or 66% illiteracy? Illiteracy. Oh my goodness, it's even worse than I it thought. It is. And then our suburban number is 40% illiteracy? Um, the county as a whole is a little over 40%. That's with Cleveland blended in. With Cleveland blended in, but the, the including a lot of the outer themselves. suburbs too. Okay. Do we know what the number is when you don't put Cleveland into that mix? I don't know that. Can you tell, can you find that out and send it to the chair or just? I can attempt. So most of the data is done um, by counties. Um, Case did the study that you guys have in regards to the neighborhood breakdown, but most of them are counties. Um, there's an organization called PIAC, I will be happy to see what I can pull for you guys to have that data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman, <coughs> to the chair, to Ms. Atler, um, what is the number that actually uh, graduates from you? I know you have two seeds of literacy, uh, one on the east side, and I think I passed the west side location the other day. So how many... Uh, just say less, last year, how many successfully completed the program? So in addition to our two physical locations, we actually have a virtual classroom. So that was born out of COVID um, and has remained extremely popular. So really trying to address the transportation and the child care barriers. So on average, we have about 100 students earning their GED every year. Um, the average student comes in below a fifth grade math level and below an eighth grade reading level into our door. So it's a longer process for our students. So, um, do they have weekly class? How, how, how frequent do you have them during the week? So we actually have three class sessions per day, Monday through Thursday, all three sites, east, west, and virtual, and students can participate in any class session they like. So if Monday they want to come in the morning, Tuesday in the afternoon, that flexibility is available to them. We also take in new students every single week to our program, so they're not waiting for a month end or a new semester to start. They're able to jump into the program anytime that they like. And, and I see you have, my next question was about volunteers, but I see you have over 200 volunteers. We do. We've been very fortunate, um, which has allowed us to really remain true to our mission and that one-on-one -on -one instruction. But we are always in need of more um, with the new students coming in every single week and the popularity of our virtual classroom continues to grow. We have that happy fear that one day when we log on, there will be hundreds more students. Sure. But we want to be able to serve them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this money is directed toward the GED um, program specifically? It, it is, and towards our volunteer recruitment efforts to really kind of build up capacity to make sure that each student is able to have that one-on-one -on -one instruction. But do you, do you also do just tutoring to help people read we in do. addition to this? Yes, so, so whatever an individual's goal is to improve their education, we're happy to help them, whether it's to learn to read, to get their high school diploma, advance more at work, help them, you know, in their developmental skills before they are in post-secondary, we are happy to support them. Do you have an opinion on getting in, I know you're doing older adults, but what to do at the beginning of people's lives, children to remedy this? So you said you want, probably the goal is to see less people on board with it, this program. It is, ideally we'd like to be dis dissolved. <laughs> Right. So we, we've supported, you know, Dolly Parton literacy, you know, universal pre-K. What, what do you think would be helpful for us to consider if we haven't already something to help with the front end? 
I really think what we do here at Seeds is that really that front end. If you don't have parents who have those ability, they will never pass it on from generation to the next generation. Um, I am celebrating my 20th year at Seeds. Um, before that, I was in the K through 12 world. Um, and I really see the strongest impact with the adult population. So the adults being able to read to the, the children. Uh, yep. And the books. strongest, yep. And the strongest indicator of a child's success is the mother's reading level. Um, not neighborhoods, not family, um, family income. It's really the mother's reading level. Yeah. How impactful a mother's connection to reading is, but yeah. the deciding factor. That is the factor. Yes, deciding factor. Do you, yeah. do you think once um, these moms or dads begin to read um, through your program and get the GED or not, would it be helpful to connect them or do you already with the Dolly Parton group so that books can be begin to be delivered to those households that the parents are going through your program yes. or is, would be a nice connection to make? So we do have a partnership with the Literacy Cooperative. We worked really closely. I was really involved in the initial start of that organization as well as a variety of other adult literacy programs. But that is a big goal of a lot of our students is really to be able to help their children. They've kind of really hit that point where they can't read to them or aren't able to help them with their homework. So that's that motivation to walk through our door. Well, I'd like to see, since we're funding both, potentially, that those be connected. Are you telling me that they are? Oh, they are connected, yes. Way? Yeah, okay. yeah. So yes. that will be yeah. happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Bonnie, did you work for them at one point in time? I did not. Because I've heard your name before, oh. and I was just Hopefully wondering if that good. was no. why. <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of the jail here, I know that there's some education for when our inmates are here usually up to six months on a bad day. But do you know, they're getting GED education. Are you part of that? Do you want to be part of that? And can you be part of that? I would love to be a part of that. We did apply for that grant a couple of years ago. Um, and unfortunately, we were not selected, um, but the county library was selected. Okay. Um, so um, we are part of that Aspire funding. We do receive a small percent of our operating budget from the state, um, and that's where the county library receives their funding. Pardon me? The, this... Yeah, through the Aspire, prog the Aspire grant through the state of Ohio. So the county library, is their program is 100% funded by that, and our budget's about 20% funded by that. So we probably need to bring them in to see what they're doing. Yes. But they've been here once before. Yeah, I think I think their third year is, yeah. I think their contract's wrapping up. So I don't know if it will be an open bid again. Or and you're going to apply again if it's open. We will apply again, okay. yes. Okay. And, and you think you could bring um, a certain angle or advantage? I do. I really think our model is just so very different. Um, the other Aspire programs, which is Tri-C, the County Library, and Polaris, all offer classroom-style instruction. And we know our students didn't succeed in that traditional classroom, so we really have not brought them back into that situation. That's why we offer the one-on-one -on -one instruction. The tutoring. The tutoring. So um, our classroom is set up where there's what we call site coordinators. People will always look at them and teachers. Um, and we'll match the students and the tutors together. So each student has like a traditional educational portfolio, has all their assessment information, anything that they prior worked on. And then the site coordinator is to know the strength and the weaknesses of the tutors, as well as the need of the students and be able to ma match that during the day. And then and also be able to step in where needed if the tutor and tutors and student interaction isn't well to kind of do a little shifting. Okay, fantastic. Any more questions? Okay, yeah. someone. I just wanted to ask in terms of uh, for prevention, um, all about prevention. How do you work closely with the schools, um, CMSD schools in particular, in regards to the, the students that have been identified, you know, in a classroom that you know, may not, may be struggling, especially uh, at the second grade level, because I believe the third grade level at the state, you still have to yeah, pass, yes, yeah. or pass the tests. Are, are you guys uh, kind of partnering with them to help assist those kids and, you know, that they can read a little bit maybe, okay. but need to. So our focus is strictly on adults. We do a lot with the family self-sufficiencies, really trying to be involved with the parents. Um, we're always at the open houses and any kind of community events to really share our services and let um, parents know that we're available if they need assistance. Thank you. 
Madam I'm, Chair. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. I move that we um, send this to <coughs> full council uh, for the three readings. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so thank you very much. This will go through three readings. We'll go a second reading, the next council meeting, and then third reading after that. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you so much Hopefully for letting me you. share information. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Um, so we're going to, um, I have no mis miscellaneous business except to highlight our former policy um, guy for council, um, now Mayor Saren, who um, is champion controversially at times with the no-mo and for the environmental impact. I yanked his chain Heights. just last week. Pardon me? I yanked his chain just last week. Hey, Mayor, no-mo? No-mo, yeah, no <laughs> Exactly. So what that is is he, um, the mayor, learned about the value of having um, the flowers not be mowed down in the month this spring so the, the pollinators have a chance to get their nourishment before they just get obliterated. And so he's um, giving people passes, residents in, in Cleveland Heights, the ability not to be cited if they choose to opt in, opt in and, you know, to allow the pollinators to um, get what they need and, and it helps the whole population. And it's an interesting, controversial um, initiative, and I appreciate him doing that. Well, I didn't think it was that big of it. I mean, it is substantive, but I didn't think it deserved the media attention. I kind of just thought it was, you know, something that mayors get to do because they're mayors. And it's one of those things. It's innovative. It's controversial because people, a lot of people still want their sterile, you know, impeccable green pesticide ridden lawns so they get freaked I out like by seeing my mode but i i don't use any pesticides on it that's, that's so i think i think you should be free at least <laughs> once in a while to in, do what you want to do he's busy enough okay so any comment from the, the, the birds can fly to my house it's, it's good <laughs> you know good the bees Who, i bees mean i'm, especially. I'm driving I was either driving to Akron or to Columbus when I heard it on uh, one of the podcasts. And I was yeah. like, good for him. It's on CPN. It's he's making the news. All right. So that concludes our meeting. Thank you. <laughs>